on this episode of China Unscripted. China and Russia are BFFs, until they're not. Tensions just under the surface today could boil over tomorrow. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. And joining us today is David Stilwell. He's the former Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. He also served in the Air Force for 35 years, including as the defense attache at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. He's also been the director of the China Strategic Focus Group at U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. It's great to have you back on the podcast. Well, thanks for letting me uh, come back and pontificate. Oh, absolutely. You are the best pontificator we've ever had. Don't tell Cleo. Uh, So today, I think we want to kind of focus on the Russia-China relationship. And especially, is is it a situation of the enemy of my enemy is my friend? Because on the surface, China and Russia seem to have a good relationship. China, you know, has been helping break uh, Western sanctions on Russia, uh, you know, through through trade. Uh, Putin uh, visited China, I think, two weeks ago for the Belt and Road uh, Summit for Forum, what they call it. But, you know, is this relationship really as solid as they're kind of presenting it? Is it really a no-limits friendship? Well, that's what we've been told, right? That's what you believe. Um, you know, we had the the U.S.-Chinese rapprochement in 1972. You see, I was at State Department before. I like to say stuff like that. But we had that, yeah, the uh, U.S., but we always believed that there was going to be these mutual interests between Moscow and Beijing. And I didn't really understand the fact that that wasn't the case uh, until I was in Beijing as defense attache. And, I mean, one of the most bizarre um, bar scene from Star Wars thing you can imagine is I'm, we're in the Russian embassy, which is old school diplomacy. I mean, it's high ceilings, it, the chandeliers and all that stuff. And I'm talking to my Russian counterpart in Chinese. So you're staying on the sidelines and watch these two, you know, Caucasian faces just going to town in Chinese. And all that guy can do is complain about how badly the PRC has treated Russia, you know, in spite of all friendship over the years. And he just keeps going and going. And so I start thinking about, well, wow, how does that work out? And, and, uh, you know, so I started looking into it. And, you know, if you work your time backwards, I got I got a photo back here of a, a PLA fighter. But if you remember during the initial major arms transfers between modern Russia and, and China, the Su-27 flanker, Su-30, Su-35, uh, their uh, SA-10, SA-20 surface air missile systems, the PRC would order like a full, you know, 100 or 200 of these airplanes. They would take delivery on two cancel the order, and then reverse engineer these things, and then sell them as J-11s and J-15s and such to the rest of the world, completely undermining the Russian economy. And so for a time there in the late 90s, maybe early 2000s, arms sales between Russia and China were at a standstill. And so this is the kind of the milieu I walked into when I was talking to my Russian counterpart. So then we started looking into it. And then the, the most the most major issue here that we should talk about is Vladivostok. It doesn't take yeah. a whole lot of research to discover that Vladivostok has a, a Chinese name, uh, Hai Shunwei. And it was called Hai Shunwei for 200 years, uh, starting with the, the Treaty of Nurchinsk in 1689, where a strong Qing dynasty and a weak Moscow, the Qing took most of eastern Siberia to include Vladivostok. Real but, quick, before we go on, I just want to put up on screen uh, sort of a map of where Vladivostok is so the uh, audience has an idea. You know, it's a, it's a major port that, uh, you know, it gives China direct direct access to the Sea of Japan. Huge. So now that I think we kind of, everyone has a context of what this is, yeah, please uh, carry on. Yeah, no, the, str- the strategic implications of not having access to the Sea of Japan at Vladivostok are, are impossible to under underestimate. Oh, and while we're on that one, look at the border between North Korea and Russia. It excludes China. There's a 10-kilometer stretch of the... Uh, uh, what river is that? Uh, I'll think of it in a second. But anyway, there's a river that goes and the PRC could actually, you know, dredge it and run ships there. But Russia and China, or actually it was the Soviet Union and North Korea, built a very low bridge across the river there, Tumen, the Tumangan, I think. But they built this bridge, so there's no chance. They could dredge the heck out of it. They couldn't get a boat under it. I mean, these are so obvious signals that most of us miss that I hope to elucidate uh, today. And so, uh, in 1860, when you think of the unequal treaties, the beginning of the century of humiliation and all those things, the, the, it kicked off with the unequal treaties. This one, the Treaty of Peking, it's called. And there were three signatories. What are the two we all know about? Well, British and then the French, right? Um, no one talks about the, the third signatory, which is the Russians. 
And when they signed that piece of paper, it took Vladivostok back. So as of 1860, Haishin Wei reverted back to its, uh, the name, or it picked up the name Vladivostok. So that's a big deal. And my Chinese counterparts, when I talked to them about this, they're like going, uh, we don't want the netizens talking about this, right? You know, rather than claiming the entire South China Sea based on these spurious Ming China or Ming uh, shards of China, you know, on the subterranean or, or, you know, submarine floor. I mean, those are really hard claims to substantiate, but their claims to Vladivostok are pretty valid when you think about it. So that right there is an area that both the Chinese and the Russians recognize as a problem. You wonder why uh, Putin hosted Xi Jinping in Vladivostok that time when they were making those um, caviar roll-ups. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was a poke in the eye to his friend Xi Jinping. Hmm. Now, that's interesting because I, I know there's been a lot of history between the Soviet Union and communist China, and it's it's not always been good. But I always kind of thought there was that Putin and she might actually kind of like each other. Like, you know, there's the friendship medal she gave to Putin. I think Putin gave she a bunch of like Russian ice cream he liked. For his birthday, when yeah. they were at some summit, I think, yeah. But this is interesting that you're mentioning, like, you know, oh, yeah, they're they're rolling up these caviar rolls. Yeah, I do think it's lost on Putin. And then my favorite um, meme for this is the, uh, the Economist cover from 2019 or 20, probably 19, of a small Russian bear sitting in the lap of a giant panda. And mm. Mm. that drove a stake in the heart of you know, Putin, which he's probably suffering from right now, if the rumors are true. Uh yeah, these are all things that point to the frictions and the uh, uh, the fraught relationship. It's a marriage of convenience. Interests are over, only overlapping in a very small way. Here's another example. 2014, invasion of uh, Crimea and eastern uh, Ukraine. We sanctioned the Russian economy. So Russia has no access to you know anything reasonable economically. So they are uh, they need to sell. There's been a negotiations on a pipeline called the Power of Siberia pipeline that had been stalled because, you know, Chi the Chinese kept coming in low ball and the Russians weren't taking it. Well, interestingly, the Power of Siberia contract was signed in 2014 for $600 billion, which was, I think, far below. It's like a 10-year contract of just endless energy, uh, far below what the Russians were asking. But they needed the cash and their friends, the Chinese, came in and low ball them. I think that is, that's still stuck in their craw. And I got a long list of these things if you want to, you know, run down it. But here's the area we should focus on in the future because Vladivostok is kind of in the past. We're not talking about Central Asia. We really need to talk about Central Asia. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, when uh, when Mao was chairman of the Communist Party, there was a lot of tension between him and uh, and the Soviet Union. And one of the things was I remember is that Mao would would sort of always on the surface pretend like he was friends and maybe that that China was the the dutiful little brother to the Soviet Union. And obviously the CCP got started through the the third common turn from the Soviet Union. So there's there's that relationship, but Mao was always essentially lying through his teeth. I mean about lots of things, but in but he also about didn't have Union. many teeth left by the end. By the end, yeah, cuz cuz you know he didn't brush his teeth, he would only rinse his mouth out with tea. They were green. That's a, that's a tangent. It's but it's very gross. Um <laughs> At any rate, so so what the U.S. had done is uh, kind of eventually saw these tensions right in the '70s, and there's this idea that you could you could separate them a bit. Well, a major tank war on the Ussuri River in 1969. Everybody kind of glosses over that too. I mean, a major war between two. And guess what? Uh, two years after that, Henry Kissinger is in Beijing negotiating some sort of a mutual treaty. I mean, you think the PRC really wanted to be aligned with the U.S.? Of course not, but. You got the, the enemy right on my doorstep and then the enemy, as they call us, they still call us that, uh, 8,000 miles away across the Pacific. So we were uh, an easy bet. It was also a marriage of convenience. Uh, well, exactly. Um, and I, look, I was a believer in that. You know, I, I was spouting that until I got to the embassy in Beijing and went, oh, man, I've been wrong all this time. I wish more people would like have that reckoning. You know, yeah, I guess I got this wrong. There's a lot of Kissinger uh, type people who probably should be should be like, oh, whoops, that maybe, yeah. that was wrong. What uh, do you remember? Like a moment of like being like, okay, I need to reevaluate this. It was uh, about three weeks into my stay uh, there in Beijing, and 
I had asked for a meeting with my counterpart. Again, actually, he wasn't my counterpart. That's another thing. My counterpart was this one star named uh, uh, Lee Ji. There we go, Admiral Lee Ji. But I get stuck with this guy named Hong Shui Ping. I think he's still in the system. Anyway, so I finally he finally comes over for you know lunch or whatever, and he says, uh, you know, hey, I'm Dave. You can call me Dave or whatever. And he, I go, what do I call you? He goes, you can call me Lao Huang. I, and I'm going, I mean, he, like, I didn't do my homework. I go, dude, you're four years younger than me. Why am I going to call you Lao Huang? And as soon as that happened, I see these petty, insignificant games they're playing. Like, my only means of communication with Lao Huang was by a fax. He wouldn't give me his phone number. I mean, the, the complete lack of reciprocity, which is why when I was at State Department, guess what we talked about endlessly? Reciprocity is we're going to make this relationship more balanced. We are not going to accept crap anymore. Uh, and we're going to demand things from the PRC that we have not, you know, that we deserve. Anyhow, so it was basically, I mean, as soon as I got there, I realized this relationship's and, uh, not what it's made out to be by lots of people who have conflicted interests. Well, I mean, you made a good point. We're we're kind of talking about the past and we need to talk about what's coming next. And Central Asia is a huge part. We we did an episode about this on China Uncensored, how uh, China is is really undermining Russian efforts in Central Asia and like you know, Kazakhstan, a lot of these kind of places. So, uh, what is what is your take on that? What do we need to watch out for? If you look at the Belt and Road, right, we got the uh, Maritime Road, in this you know straight line belt. Well, it goes right through Central Asia. So the Russians have their Eastern Economic Union, I think it's called. Then they've got their uh, CSTO, the Central State Treaty Organization. These are long-term established uh, things. But meantime, here comes this Belt Road with plenty of cash and influence that it seeks to divide these uh, areas from, from the uh, Russians. It's mostly economic, but I don't think, don't for a minute think that Putin uh, appreciates this. And if he's going to go to war over Ukraine, uh, getting too close to NATO, another area of a former Russian sphere of influence, and, and like you guys are talking about, the Central Asia is, is even you know, even more tense and fraught. And so, again, this is an area where Putin holds his nose, but I'm pretty sure he's got a plan to, to resolve this. Um, so uh, I can talk a lot more about that, but here's why. Look at Charlie Wilson's War, you know, one very entertaining movie, but to look at our strategy back then, it was pretty sound. It was, you know, Russians are overextended in Central Asia and Afghanistan in this case. Uh, and presents uh, vulnerabilities. They're overextended in Pakistan and Afghanistan right now. And rather than our like knee-jerk reaction to come help them, we should allow them and the Pakistanis to enjoy the bed they made because uh, it's not going well. Meanwhile, if we help Pakistan, we put India on their back foot. Go ahead. Well, so the main thing I'm getting from this is the idea that uh, China and Russia are in some kind of alliance that will be able to trip up the U.S. or launch a successful invasion of Taiwan. It, it really is not there. No. Only, well, that's, only where it's convenient. You're not going to see Putin stick his neck out for his friend Xi Jinping when he gets trapped, bogged down in the Middle East, for instance, you know, with this Iran Riyadh thing. That's not going to go very well. Uh, so, you know, I don't think you're going to see a lot of uh, effort, political resources, whatever, uh, extended by the Russians to bail Xi Jinping out. And look at the economy right now. I mean, we're, we talk about Li Keqiang's death. Um, but he was the lead economist. Of course, he's been sidelined. And so you can see what's happening to the economy. It was completely predictable. And, you know, you can see the Beijing asking Moscow for some help on this. They ain't going to get it. How would you characterize what's happening to the Chinese economy right now? Um, truth. You know, American business is finally realizing that, uh, one, I can be arrested for no good reason or you know, exit banned for no good reason uh, because I didn't do something that the government wanted. Um, as you know, there's no consequences for lying in that system. In fact, there's consequences for telling the truth, right? You just revealed a state secret to the fact that your bank, your business is insolvent and that you may have to like uh, declare bankruptcy. That's going to get you in trouble. There's no problem with rolling over bad loans or making up data that, that keeps American investors from, from buying, you know, into your Alibaba, Tencent, whatever you want to call it, luck in. So, uh, the, 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 all that's happening now is that all those hens have come home to roost uh, and the facts, you just can't cover the facts up anymore. And, and you notice how when they're paying off, when they're uh, resolving this debt through bankruptcy, it's the renminbi denominated investment that gets treated first and then the overseas investment next. I mean, the, everybody knew this. 
It was just delusional that that American businesses and Wall Street didn't act on that. I remember just as the Evergrande thing was first happening a couple of years ago, you still saw BlackRock and like uh, fi Fidelity like going in and like establishing mutual funds in China. It's like okay, well they're not going to service the do their dollar denominated debts. Why are you putting more money into the system? Everyone was like, don't worry, the government will bail out Evergrande. Everything will be fine. And they'll bail us out too, right? They'll all should say, well, we can make all the, you know, uh, bad investments we want because just like 2008, they're going to ride to the rescue. Uh, we Hopefully you'll do a episode on the, you know, Wall Street's conflicted interests in, in finance in the PRC. Uh, again, I'm out of my depth on that one. That's, I don't really want to go there. Uh, but look, it, the truth is finally coming out. And, you know, I got it. I spent a year, in, I spent a career in the military. I am as nonpartisan as you can get, even in this time. And I, you know, give credit where credit's due. The idea of uh, assertive transparency that the Biden administration has announced is very welcome. So instead of hiding, every time I would watch a, a Chinese fighter do something really dumb on the wing of a RC 135 or whatever, you know, I would I would ask DC that would you let me go demarche these guys about this so they don't kill you know another air crew or try to kill another air crew like they did in Hainan two thousand one, and they would say no 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 we don't want to hurt the relationship. Well, you got to hold them to account for this stuff, and if you embarrass them enough, they will tell the PLA to stop that stuff. You know, five hundred feet is a long way away to stay away from, you know between a intercepting fighter and an American reconnaissance aircraft operating in international airspace. Five hundred feet is a long way away. These guys are flying at maybe 10 or, or 10 feet or less, completely uncalled for. It's just harassment. And now this Biden the government is taking them a task. Uh, and that's good. Uh, we didn't have a lot of those when during my time. And I think there was a reason for that, too. What do you think that reason was? They think they were scared of us. Hmm. Yeah, yeah I mean, it is interesting to see the U.S. government come out and actually release like information about the stuff and and the philippines are also really pushing that too yeah i wonder if there was some kind of discussion i would hope so yeah because this can't continue it, it, you know article 5 commitments with the philippines it, it, just one you know giant chinese coast guard ship sinks a philippine boat or or you know it ideally it would be a combatant but eventually we, we start to have article 5 consultations and that's the escalatory ladder man we're we're going up it we need to message that to the PRC that you know these things have consequences, and you need to get your maritime militia in the in the back in the bag because they are they are going to drag you into something you don't want. And I don't think they want that. I really don't think they can afford uh, have a South China Sea problem going on right now. Taiwan Strait with the multiple uh, centerline crossings and all that. There's way too much bubbling in their periphery uh, to add to that. So again, I think a word to the wise would probably knock off the South China Sea antics. So what you're saying is there's a risk that. China could accidentally go to war with the Philippines and the U.S. before the Taiwan invasion happens, which basically screws their whole Taiwan plan. Like, yeah, I mean, I, exactly. Sending sending six combatants to the uh, Arabian Gulf uh, because the you know they've sort of taken a back seat on maintaining peace and stability, and now you're probably sponsoring Hamas in some way, either helping Iran or turning a blind eye. Is suddenly, you know, they're at a loss for uh, energy. If, 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 you know, if things start to blow up in the Middle East, the Arabian Gulf becomes uh, uh, contested. They absolutely need to maintain peace and security in, in the Middle East, the Arabian Gulf area. They need that energy far more than we do. We should acknowledge that. Invite them in. Come on, you guys. Join in here. You know, you can bear the, the cost of this security burden for the next 20 years because, frankly, we don't need it. Uh, that's what I would do. And that, that is important for people to understand that the U.S. essentially can be energy independent, but China does not have the ability to be energy independent. They rely on uh, foreign imports of energy. Do you, do you remember two years? Go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask about the inviting them into the Arabian Gulf. I mean, because we, like U.S. military ships provide a lot of the security in that area to for the free flow of trade, oil coming through. Um, if China would take on some of that burden or uh, more of that burden. Like I f we had an expert on a couple of weeks ago who was talking about he felt it was dangerous because then 
it's essentially like when we talk about the South China Sea and all the trillions of dollars of trade that go through there, you know, having China be like in they're like a, a gatekeeper, position right? to yeah be a gatekeeper. Is that a concern in the Arabian Gulf or not so much? Again, let's look at our basic interests in the, in the Middle East. It ain't 1974 anymore, man. We, it's, you know, we we aren't sitting in gas lines. Uh, we don't have to. We definitely, you know, if we got serious about energy independence and national interests, we would just start pumping again. And, and we're already an exporter of energy, and we could be energy independent. And so, why don't we push that burden to the gov- the government that needs that energy the most by far? What do you think Guadar Port is all about? I mean, why would they put a port in Pakistan uh, in Guadar? Because it's the, it's the closest route from the Arabian Gulf to a pipeline to start moving fuel into Western China and the Kashgar. So, yes, they need that more than we do. I think they're laughing at us all the time going, I don't know why the Americans are still doing this, but we'll take it. This is a freebie. Um, we are being pulled in multiple directions. We're going to have to make priority choices. And one of those choices is to shift some of that attention finally to the Indo-Pacific, uh, which has been a bill payer all this time. So why not let – and guess what? Now suddenly they get sideways with Riyadh and Tehran and Moscow because you know Moscow wants to keep the prices up, keep the – the volume down to keep their, you know, their energy uh, expensive as possible. I mean, there's so many conflicting interests for that we are solving for the PRC that we shouldn't. And we've got to take a large strategic view of this by letting individual CENTCOM, UCOM, PACOM folks drive those decisions. A a DC level analysis needs to take place. And I I believe, I'm sure that the lowest priority is going to be the Arabian Gulf. Well, the, the the thing for that to happen is that needs to be a decision in D.C. that China is the biggest priority. And do you think that is the view in Washington? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we said pivot in 2011 and we said rebalance in 2012 and we said TPP and we said all these things. And well, we didn't actually do anything, did we? So, no, I guess not. I'll take that back. <laughs> I mean, I do, I do feel like under the Trump administration, there was that obviously a major shift in per, the perspective on how to treat China. And the Biden administration has largely carried on with that same philosophy. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, so, for sure. Um, but I don't think I didn't spend a lot of time talking to my friends in DOD about this. I mean, DOD continues at pace, right? But during the Trump administration, we ended up dealing with um, you know, other things, although compared to what happened after Trump left, and as far as things bubbling, like invasion of Ukraine and, and uh, Afghanistan and the rest, things were pretty calm. Uh, but we still had a hard time making the shift from UCOM 2014 and the Middle East, CENTCOM, uh, into PACOM. I, I'm not saying we didn't go backwards, but didn't really go that far forward. We did make some uh, progress on North Korea, again, which I had no real you know, hand in, but I thought that went well. You know, North Korea was pretty calm, you know, for that time, even even with the Moon administration, which was problematic, as you realize. Um, I mean, look, we've got Yoon in Korea. We've got uh, Marcos in the Philippines. I would have given my eye teeth for that because I had to deal with Duterte and Moon. That was tough. Yeah, it's a very, very different situation over there now. Um, but this is interesting. It seems like there's there's so many different conflicting things happening. Like I, I know some people will point to, you know, the U.S. is in, in investing a lot of money in Ukraine. And now with the Israel-Palestine thing, there's that's a focus now. Um, and this is really dividing U.S. energies. And, the, you know, some people are saying, well, this is the perfect opportunity for uh, China to come in and take Taiwan. But from everything you're saying, with China's economy going down the toilet, uh, with, you know, not – anything resembling a real alliance between China and Russia, it, it, it just kind of seems like everything is falling apart. And that's good in the fact that like China wouldn't be, might not be able to invade Taiwan. But maybe they also want to invade Taiwan more now because they need the nationalist fervor. Yeah, well, so that is what some people are, how people are analyzing this, that the, the things are becoming more likely that an invasion will happen. Right. I'm in the camp that they have no interest in invading when you've got a January 24 election that they are doing a pretty good job on influence ops there. I was there in Taiwan in August and we were talking about that. And, and look, Taiwan is on the leading edge of dealing with Chinese disinformation, you know, China Radio International. I was watching CCTV4 in, uh, I think I was in Kaohsiung at the time. And um, 
they were had this expert. I love how they tread out these experts. You know, sometimes they're Westerners, you know, useful idiots, and sometimes they're uh, mainland Chinese folks who claim to know a lot of stuff, even though they are locked down on information. But this expert's talking about how the U.S. is selling um, substandard stuff, the F-16V. Uh, the delivery is so slow, and the, F- the J-20, their uh, F-22, is far superior to all this stuff. What I found interesting is that the Taiwan actually let CCTV put that out there, because CCTV-4 is Chinese language programming for external consumption. That is not the message they're sending inside. The message that they're getting inside China is CCTV-1. Have you guys ever seen CCTV-1? Yes, unfortunately. It is this anodyne recitation of what Xi Jinping had for breakfast and then who he met with next. And if you were to watch CCTV-1 in Taiwan or here in the U.S. and not CGTN, you'd go, oh, whoa, 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 I get it. I see. Yeah, this is right back to the Soviet Union. Uh, the cult of personality, uh, completely disconnected from reality. This is pure propaganda. Uh, and so one of my goals would be to get not just Taiwan, but the U.S. to bring CCTV-1 into American homes. And so you can look at that. And maybe you guys can do that. Maybe get some clips with Li Keqiang, you know, and we know what the reality is. And here's how the Chinese propaganda machine is putting it out there. That would be- it's actually interesting with Li Keqiang's death. I was looking at Chinese state-run media websites this morning because uh, the news just broke because we're recording we're this on Friday. Friday. Yeah. Yeah. So like the news just broke. So it's interesting that, you know, Li Keqiang passes away, even in their external English language media is like tucked away into like a little corner under giant headlines about Xi Jinping hosting some like an important regional meeting about something that's in like, you know, font that's like 30 times bigger than the Li Keqiang is dead thing. And it was just interesting to kind of have that visual reminder of of uh, what the priorities of Chinese propaganda are. Well, replay Hu Jintao's unfortunate dismissal from the 20th Party Congress. And remember when Xi Jinping kind of looks over at the security and gives him the, <laughs> cut it. As Li Keqiang's walking out, he looks down, I mean, as, as Hu Jintao's looking out, he looks down at Li Keqiang. And Li Keqiang kind of like, carefully looks at him and you can see there was something there, right? Like we can't allow this sort of thing. Um, so I, palace and tree, you can imagine there were some undercurrents and you're seeing that too. The, the reports from the Japanese media on the friction at Bay Daiha, right? Where the, uh, oh, what was his name? The retired ch- uh, general officer. Zeng, uh, are you thinking of Zeng Cheng Hong supposedly no. leading like this criticism of Xi? Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, it was of that nature and everybody's like dismissing the Japanese reports, but I think there was a lot to that. When he has run the economy into the ground, when he's become this unpopular, when the CCP is no longer, you know, uh, any uh, as popular as is flagging, you got to imagine that they're, you know, whatever the Shanghai click is doing these days is really starting to go, hey, we need to change this. We need to change the leaders. It's, you know, 10 years is up and he's still here. We, we, he's going to continue to destroy our economy and, and our position in the world. So all these things point to a, a problem that in, in the past, death of Stalin, you know, what we've seen in the Soviet Union has resulted in some kinds of purges. I mean, Mao was purged in 1960 or 1961, right after the Great Leap Forward. Then he came, th- you know, roaring back in 66. But yeah, even Mao was purged. So I can see Xi Jinping getting the, the boot here. Well, the, the Mao coming roaring back, like the price of that was a decade of cultural revolution, which was one of the most destructive things in, in Chinese history. Like, I mean, it was just terrifying. But you so, have you have these power centers and these cliques. And and it's funny with how they treat their uh, senior leaders. Uh, you know, again, the Russian sense, they die of what? Deceleration sickness, like falling from a building uh, or poisoning. Uh, but the PRC is comparatively gentle with their the folks who've fallen out of favor. Like Deng Xiaoping was rehabilitated twice, right? He was sent down to the country uh, or three times, but he's, he was sent down at least twice, but he came back. So uh, Mao was sent down, but he wasn't necessarily, I mean, probably house arrest at, at worst, kind of held in reserve in case we need him again. And they, they allowed him to come back. So you can see that happening here coming up with Xi Jinping as well, I think. Uh, I think he's done enough, uh, he's made enough of a mess of things that it wouldn't be surprise me a bit if uh, after Li Keqiang's death. Have you seen the protests online? Because remember, Li Keqiang was like, he was like a grandpa Wen Jiabao. 
he was revered because he was a counterweight to this heavy handed communist thing. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because people don't really know a lot about Li Keqiang. Like I, in the New York Times obituary, like uh, announcing his death, they even said like we could not confirm his survivors. Like it was weird because uh, they were uh. just like, like he has he's he's got a wife and a daughter, but like. I couldn't find her name online, mm -hmm. but um, I just think of him as the GDP guy. Yeah, I think yeah. like Li Keqiang is kind of a blank slate for which people to hey, kind of pro all of their dreams. Yeah, project their dis dislike of Xi Jinping onto right. Like it's kind of like mm -hmm. the classic Chinese you you uh, you know praise other people's kids in order to kind of like <laughs> shame your own kids. So like Xi Jinping is in power, and like now Li Keqiang's dead, and Li Keqiang is like the best ever because we we don't like Xi Jinping and what he's, what he's doing. Well, he was a counterweight, um, and I, that's why I think he felt a favor. But it was nice that the Communist Party picked his counter, his, his successor with a similar name, Li Chang. So, that you know, that's very helpful. On that note, and then I think you guys can help me out on this one. Uh, if you look at the sacking of Li Shang Fu and uh, uh, Qing Gong, you know, Qing Gong was Xi Jinping's hand-picked boy. Right, he put him in D.C. and then he brought him back. Uh, these things all seem related to me. I, have you guys talked about that much? We have. Um, the the kind the take we're kind of doing on that right now is because with um, Li Shangfu, Qing Gang, and also a lot of the Rocket Force people, like those are all those are different types of purges than we've seen before. These were all Xi's people. Uh, like the he basically built the Rocket Force into what it is today. Xi Jinping did. Um, so kind of the analysis that we're taking on this is, is you know, Xi Jinping has sort of used uh, corruption and national security to go after purging a lot of his political opponents in the past. And now sort of his enemies are using that kind of language to force Xi's hand to go after his allies, which uh, weakens his position, makes him look unstable at best, particularly in the West, where, you know, it's 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 really reading as Stalin vibes right now. Uh, so that's kind of how we've been looking at it, that, um, yeah, this is not necessarily something she wanted to do, but was kind of forced to do. Right, which means that he is not the single power source every thinks he is. I mean, Definitely he is, not. He's made a lot of changes, going from nine to seven for the standing committee and all those things. People, again, the whole reason Hu Jintao was, when he opened that folder, he realized none of his people were on the standing committee. Uh, brings us to Liu He. Uh, we're talking about the economic and trade deal, and I hate to digress from that Russia thing, but maybe uh, Liu He in seven, uh, 19 actually came away with a peace in our time document that was going to end this trade trade friction in the U.S. Finally, standing up for trade friction, and he gets back to Beijing, and Xi Jinping, there's no way we're not going to sign up for verification regime that mechanism. That, doesn't that agreement still exist? It just hasn't been executed. Both sides, Chinese walked away from it. So, you know, my advice to anybody in the current process that cares to listen is to stand, dust that agreement off. Let's just go back to that agreement on the economy uh, that had a verification mechanism in it. So when they did walk away from it, there would be substantial penalties. So this might be a way to quickly, uh, you know, hold Xi Jinping's feet to the fire on things like trade. Oh. Yeah, I, th I think the, the big thing uh, Western observers need to understand is that Xi Jinping is not and has never been in this sort of position of absolute power. Um, you know, he was struggling with the Shanghai clique, the Jiang Zemin faction, we've been calling it for so uh, for so long. Uh, even after his death, that's ongoing with uh, basically Jiang's right-hand man, Zheng Chenghong, still kind of leading the fray. And just with the economic troubles and popular resentment against Xi Jinping, uh, you know, this is this is kind of one of the the reasons we've been analyzing that China likely won't start a war over Taiwan right now is that, you know, that would require Xi Jinping putting somebody in charge of, you know, China's joint command. And that would mean that person would become the most powerful person in China and he would be enabling very likely a coup. And so she is kind of paralyzed. There's, there's, he can't do too much without undermining his own position. And you know, from what I've been hearing, like he is not getting uh, a lot of information from his people. People aren't executing his decisions very well. 
he's just becoming more and more isolated, even within the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, where the PPLA is concerned, I completely agree. And how many times has he said, prepare for war? And you and I and all my, I asked my cadets, what does that mean? They go, well, I mean, it's like, you know, lock and load, get you pick up your rucksack and go fight. No, what he means when he says prepare for war is stop dabbling in expensive art, stop selling real estate, stop lining your pockets, stop selling your stuff to Burma. I mean, it, it is the most corrupt organization. I mean, you know, I can statistically show you it's the most corrupt organization in the Chinese government. The PLA, um, you mean? The PLA. And I, he, when he says that, what he's saying is, I don't believe you can do anything that you claim to be able to do, right? That's mm. clearly the message. And he keeps saying that, which tells you, is he really going to risk it all on Taiwan with an organization that hasn't really been challenged since, and even 1979 wasn't a real challenge. They haven't really been tested since the Civil War. So uh, if I were him, you know, he looks at the U.S. military and, you know, we've been fighting nonstop for 30 years. Uh, I wouldn't pull that. I wouldn't even think about trying that. Remember, uh, military activity with Taiwan, whether it's a blockade or, or an invasion or whatever, uh, involves the uh, risk of loss, if I used to insur- use insurance or investment terms. If he loses, he's done. That, that's his neck. Uh, and so, you know, we can still mess around in the information space, the economic space, legal and all the rest with very low risk. When you start pulling triggers, uh, the risk goes way up. And I don't think he's willing to accept it. Especially with the rocket force purges again. Like it was so strange because he was the one who basically made, like elevated it to become a thing. It was, it seemed like the most modernized, capable branch of uh, the PLA. And then to suddenly purge top officials or top generals. It's, it's really a bizarre thing. As a, as a military guy, I can tell you, you know, military people, even in the PLA are very, uh, results oriented right? because you, you you either win or you lose you live or you die uh, compared to economics and others which are longer term and more squishy right and so uh, his own military I'm sure is watching these changes at, at that time and realizing they weren't really beneficial uh, probably threatening their own income and status but also uh, you know putting the PLA the PRC security at risk. So you can imagine they would be one of the first groups to sit up and go, hey, boss, this is not a good idea. And as soon as you push back on, on you know, an authoritarian system like that, you're disloyal and you need to be uh, cashiered. Do you think that the outcome of the 2024 election will affect Xi Jinping's calculus on whether or when to invade Taiwan? Are you talking about Taiwan's 2024 election? Uh, I, or the U.S. I actually meant the U.S., but but we also should think about Taiwan. I guess there's really two questions there. Well, Taiwan, uh, I think so, but it just depends on how the campaign goes. Because if you've got, you know, DPP coming out strongly on it and saying independence, they have said that would be a trigger, uh, whether they get actually executed or not. Yeah, and I would think that their response would be incremental. I don't think the missiles would start flying right away. Uh, you would see something more akin to a blockade. You know, because again, there's a lot of risk in, in attempting to invade and then failing. And then let's go back to the whole problem with the Chinese military. The people in the U.S. volunteer for military service, like I did when I was 18 years old, because it's honorable uh, and that uh, we know the military is competent and it's a social elevator for you, right? You can, you can the military is still, you know, one of the better meritocracies in the in the U.S. That's not how it's perceived in a one child system country where you've got one kid and, and if it's wasted in some adventure on the Indian border or whatever, that's it. The Wong family is done. That that family tree just left. And of course, in Confucian sense, military service is actually on the lowest end. There's no honor in that. So, you know, the PLA is not getting the best and brightest. However, as the economy t- turns down, you're seeing a lot more interest in joining the, uh, b- the government, the party. And I think you're going to see a lot more interest in more qualified people joining the PLA, but that won't have an effect for 10 to 20 years. So it's still basically the dregs, uh, the people who couldn't survive, who couldn't get to Beida, who couldn't uh, get into business and all the rest. And and that's what we saw uh, in dealing with the PLA as defense attache. Well, from your perspective, since you have a lot of experience with China, what do you think might happen if Xi Jinping is removed from power somehow? Is, because I know there's, there's, Lots of people who want to go back to the way things were in like the 2000s, where it's still a Chinese Communist Party committing horrible human rights atrocities and still stealing American intellectual property, but just on the surface, things get better. 
uh, you know, people, some people can make money. Well, I mean, it felt welcoming to f to foreign businesses because Jiang Zemin made a big effort. To, they weren't getting arrested. To, to, yeah, to like not, he, he was only, he was only killing, you know, the Tibetans and the Falun Gong. He wasn't arresting Western business people. So that it was like, uh, yeah. So do you think that's, that's likely to return to that era? Yeah, I can't, I mean, look, um, those who forget their history doomed to repeat it, looking at how this has happened, not just in the Chinese sense, but in the Soviet sense, there, there's always this period of, of moderation after it gets just too weird. Mao and Deng Xiaoping was a pro part of that. Now, people remind me that Deng Xiaoping was no humanist. I mean, he was in every way a, a, a you know a communist too, but he moderated the behavior of the of the CCP to the great you know joy of the Chinese people who weren't you know running through this cultural revolution mess, but to the West as well. Uh, all of a sudden, it was okay to make money, to get rich is glorious, and all the rest. So again, even Deng Xiaoping was was not saint. Or, uh, you know, Mother Teresa, but he was far better than his predecessor. And then this brings us to that Evan Osno's piece about the age of malaise, which I thought was fantastic. I mean, there were some areas in there that you could argue, but overall, yeah, you know, getting in there and talking to people in the PRC today to see how they're feeling. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of the same things. People are just fed up. But the security process, the security, you know, burden is so high that nobody really has the, the courage to say something, but they soon will, I believe, especially if they're given a green light. And as you saw during zero COVID, uh, that was a green light. People said, it's enough, we're done. And Xi Jinping had to back down from his very bad zero COVID idea. So again, if you haven't read that uh, article by Evan Osnos, it's uh, well worth the read. Okay, so we can provide a, a link to it in the description. I'm sure he wouldn't mind. Um, yeah, and you know, you mentioned zero COVID. Like that's another X factor that nobody really knows how it's affecting Xi Jinping or the Chinese Communist Party. Like we don't really know how many people in China died from COVID. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we, they stopped publishing cremation stat. We don't even know how the economy's doing. I mean, we have people yeah. investing in something they have no visibility on. Yeah, I mean, in, a, in, in that system, remember, it's easier and it's uh, uh, better to lie than to tell the truth, because if you tell the truth, you can be accused of revealing state secrets. And if you lie, you lie to inflate your data to match that of the five-year plan. So that that line, that trajectory meets perfectly at you know 2022 or 2021, the first centenary goal, right? We doubled the income uh, of the Chinese people. And it just magically happened to meet just perfectly, right? That's because they're making it up. And again, I don't understand why Wall Street doesn't do more to you know, get real facts or demand real data. It's the same thing with COVID. Uh, there's going to be a reckoning on COVID. It's got to happen eventually to find out that one, the World Health Organization enabled the pandemic by not declaring a public health uh, emergency of an international consequence until March um, by, you know, in, intentionally self-censoring where they looked and investigated, but not demanding access to the Wuhan Institute. We have mechanisms in the international system in the UN to hold the PRC to account but the PRC has subverted them to its own purposes. And we've got to say something and stop this world. You know, they're on the Human Rights Council right now. Can you believe that? They're committing genocide. We're inviting him to the U.S., a genocidal leader. We're inviting him to APEC next month. How is this not Neville Chamberlain, you know, peace in our time? Well, how do you how do you think the U.S. should handle that APEC summit? Should, should they say... Xi Jinping, you can't come. Well, we should one stop begging him to come, and then two, I would deny a visa. We denied visas to, I mean, for a long time to Modi, because of what happened in Gujarat when he was there as the you know the regional boss. And then we, of course, you know, took rescinded that. But yeah, I mean, if you declare a genocide, shouldn't the leader that's you know overseeing that genocide then be held accountable for that? That's well, you wouldn't want to hurt China's feelings. Yeah, yeah, also as an expert on genocide, that also makes him an expert on human rights. Exactly. I mean, the, the contradictions here are uh, unimaginable. But let's go back to the original topic, Western China and the stands. Remember, it's, we, uh, Xinjiang, Xinjiang's original name, Xinjiang, New Frontier, right, has not always been Chinese territory. Let's, let's you know, explore the language a bit. The real name is East Turkestan. We were talking about the five stands, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tur Turkestan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, but there was a sixth, and that's East Turkestan, uh, you know, annexed uh, back in 1950, 1951. Why don't we talk about that more? And Tibet, 
the Dalai Lama is, you know, uh, getting ready to depart. He's named his successor. Unfortunately, Chinese law says he can't reincarnate outside of Tibet. Again, the idiocy of that. We should be mocking that. We should be, and then, you know, we should support Tibet. I was at an event, uh, a conference, I can't tell you which one, but because of Chatham House, but uh, the Chinese rep, a guy named Da Wei, who's out and about right now. I mean, he's the guy who's allowed to gently criticize the PRC. So he looks like he's one of us, but he's not. I, on one of my slides, I put the word Tibet. And I was basically saying India's perspective on Tibet. I wasn't mentioning it, you know, as an, as an American. That guy, he he completely dropped the uh, the pretense of being a friendly, happy guy, and he just made a complete spectacle of himself in front of the whole group. And then the meeting adjourned, and then in, very publicly came to me and castigated me in a, in a very loud voice for even saying Tibet on one of my slides. I see they're a little sensitive on this topic. You know, why don't we, we should push? We should Central Asia. The border with Xinjiang, East Turkestan, these are all things that we should be talking about. The genocide, and we're not. I'm curious, talking about Central Asia, how you think um, Russia and China are going to intersect there? Because it's interesting, China's moving in economically with the Belt and Road, but uh, in some of these reports of like, you know, uh, Uyghurs and Kazakhs being taken by China, there's been reports of people being kidnapped from Kazakhstan um, back into Xinjiang and China. And Kazakhstan is also, you know, historically like a satellite of the Russia. Soviet Union, the Russia, and Russia has security personnel in Kazakhstan. And some of these reports and like people were talking about essentially being taken in by Russian security personnel working in Kazakhstan in order to help the CCP like repatriate people to China. Um, so what do you think that is going to happen if like the CCP continues to kind of move into these towns, not just like economically, but politically? You remember Operation Fox Hunt is not just the U.S., it's global. And most countries uh, resist less than we do on these forced extraditions. Kazakhstan is one of them. No, I would think that the Russians would take great umbrage at that, especially if one of these Kazakhs happens to be their boy, you know, uh, they're in Astana or whatever. So uh, again, but Russia can't say too much because they're uh, in, in many ways uh, obligated to maintain this facade of, of friendship and all the rest. But you asked about where we can push the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, you know, when that first came up, I'd scared the crap out of me. This, this could actually be something. Just but for our you, viewers, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a little bit like a Chinese NATO. Correct. It, it's in theory just a talk shop, but in fact, the major event out of each uh, annual event is a military exercise. It's, it's purported to be counter-terror, but it happens to be a beach landing in a counter-terror operation. Hmm. Yeah, but the SDO, uh, the Russians have no real interest in supporting that. If you look at the amount of Russian participation in these Shanghai Cooperation Organization exercises and the number of Chinese participants, it's way out of whack. And so clearly there's greater interest on the one side than in Beijing and Moscow. And it is in direct conflict with the Central States Treaty Organization, CSTO, which was already in existence and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has sort of tried to displace it. So again, these are obvious areas where China is, is pushing Russian influence out of Russia's sphere of influence. Uh, and if I was the Russians, I would speak up. Also, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization includes India and Pakistan, How's that working? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's hilarious how, how uh, you know, cobbled together it is, yeah, how it's not uh, anything of real. No, but it, it's not to say it, does, it can't have impact. It could. Iran's in it. I think Afghanistan's now part of it. Uh, we should watch it closely, and then we should, you know, obviously message on where it's failing. Well, I guess my, my question is, Putin obviously must know uh, – all the ways China is pushing Russia influence out of uh, Central Asia, and he must also be seeing the precarious position Xi Jinping is in. How do you, like, what is what is he planning? Like, he can't, like, obviously he knows this friendship is a sham. Xi Jinping is not, he might not be there forever. Xi Jinping is taller than Putin. Have you ever seen them together? I mean, that just in itself is a message. I mean, it's got to be psychologically very painful for Putin to deal with that. And then there's rumors. I know, but P Putin does look much better shirtless on a horse. Uh, that's true. Um, but uh, your, your, your question brought to mind the Arctic because this mm. 
So Asia and the Arctic are two sides of the same coin. Uh, you know, the PRC is blasting through Central Asia. And so is it any wonder why Russia is actively resisting uh, the Chinese attempts to use the Arctic as its, you know, uh, shorter route to markets and such? And no, and the Russians are not going to enable their lips and teeth partner, the Chinese, um, to now surround them by putting the PLA Navy in the Arctic and and, and the PLA Army forces in Afghanistan or the, the irregular forces that they've got out there. I mean, you think if you're Russia, you're feeling contained by the Chinese. Uh, and let's talk about the word containment. Uh, there was a recent article here about how a, a, you know we need to entangle uh, the Chinese into the international system. This idea of you know a revitalized binding strategy. The, the, the article talks about that the U.S. has no strategy. Well, I, I hate to say it, we just don't want to say it. The strategy has been since 2017 to contain this badness, right? That's what I was trying to do there is this containment. The pandemic, the first thing we try to do is to contain the pandemic. So we are back to a Cold War strategy of containment. And it, it worked last time. Why are we so adverse to admitting we're doing containment this time? I don't know. We should. It's a Cold War mentality. Yeah. And, and of course, we we react to that. Like, that's a bad thing. I, I think yeah. it, we know it is to- a Cold War. I mean, I think yeah, I'm just reminded of like Blinken's first China policy speech where he kept talking about how we need to like if like, you know, if China wants to be part of the international order, it needs to do such and such. But then the assumption or like the message we're being is like we assume that the CCP wants to be part of the international order. Only to only to undermine it. Yeah. They don't want to be part of the international order as it stands. And the rest of the world likes it. Right. This has been the most successful global organization for the last 70 years. Um, so, but the PRC doesn't like it. So why shouldn't we jealously defend it instead of try to adapt it to this new uh, organization, the CCP that wants to ruin it? I don't know. World Health Organization, uh, WIPO, we barely kept them out of the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, I mean, I'd give you a lot of examples. We should get, they should be out of that organization or they should be at least be minimized in, in the international system. Or we should create a new one in a containment mindset that in only includes people that want to, you know, pursue prosperity and peace, not genocide. I mean, is there a way to contain them in places like the WHO or the UN, places where they're already like so influential? As you know, they use this idea of elite capture to get people from lesser, you know, uh, lower income countries to vote their way in the UN. I think the only way to do it is to just start over in some form. It, again, I, I keep going back to the World Health Organization, but the World Trade Organization has, has similarly failed. The World Bank has similarly failed, where it's completely under the control of the PRC. I mean, the World Bank is completely infiltrated. And, and PRC people who have admitted, as you recall, that they are not in the United Nations to advance global interests. They are there to advance PRC interests. They're, they're the only country that actually says that. And so they're in the World Bank doing all they can to advance PRC interests, you know, and they run it. They may not run it uh, at the top, but by putting their bureaucrats throughout the organization, they are very uh, adept at driving decisions that support Chinese initial interests and not global interests. So you think these international organizations have basically become about as effective as the League of Nations? Well, yeah. Again, because you have bought, you've you know brought the fox into the hen house. And you're letting it run amok in the house. The, the UN worked fine when there was one Soviet Union and the rest of the world was basically in agreement that we need to resist that. And the UN and the Soviets weren't necessarily that influenced because they didn't have any really economic clout. But the PRC with its, you know, Renminbi influence is getting people to make the wrong decisions because there's financial or personal interests involved. I mean, it's a great system when you think about it, if you want to undermine a, a well-functioning international system, but it's not making the UN a better organization. And we should we should not participate in a human rights council that undermines human rights. I mean, sort of a counterpoint to that would be the United Nations is at least a forum where you can have safe diplomatic exchanges about things. Uh, and if you completely destroy the United Nations or pull out so that it dissolves into nothingness, uh, then you lose those opportunities, right, to, to have those dialogues. I mean, yeah, that's, I, what do you think about that? I would disagree. I mean, look, in the, in, the, in, the, in the era of social media, you can do those things, you know, 
any number of ways you could get them done. The original idea was working when all were dedicated to the same concepts and ideals. That is no longer the case. It has been completely corrupted. And eventually you're going to have to just fold it up. The U.S. contributed $500 million a year to the World Health Organization prior to the Trump administration saying it doesn't work anymore. We're out of here. 80% of that money went to travel. And then there's the tax that funds the World Health Organization. We were actually doing more for public health by pulling that $500 million back and then st- taking it direct to the organizations that were receiving it through the World Health Organization. And then you've got the American program PEPFAR, which you know sought to eradicate AIDS, Ebola, and all those things. You know that was a 1.1 billion dollars uh, over the over. Actually, it was more than that. Anyway, it was a lot of money that didn't go through the World Health Organization. The point is, why keep these things going when they are clearly no longer suited to task? When you have other ways to go about it, and and this goes to the point uh, that the current administration feels we have to have sit down, and have face to face conversations with PRC. Uh, I did a, a presentation at the East-West Center called uh, The Folly of Engagement, where I talked about the fact you shouldn't bend over backwards to get a meeting in, in, in Beijing, only be sent to Tianjin to do it via VTC. There is no real benefit to having a face-to-face conversation with these folks. So if it comes down to it, get out what my counterpart called the megaphone, and we'll have megaphone diplomacy. We'll just say the same thing we're going to say to you in private. We'll just say it in public. That has worked very well in the past to get them to go, okay, 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 okay we'll go back to having private conversations, right? Megaphone diplomacy is the alternative to -to face-to-face meetings. There is no real benefit in having a face-to-face meeting with PRC. Except the State Department, like the State Department's job is diplomacy as they see it, right? So their job is to talk and have dialogue as from their perspective. And so like, even if the, the White House's larger goal is something else, the State Department is still like, you know, pursuing dialogue at the cost of other things. Yeah, so I, what I'd say is take the time that you're not wasting, you know, going to Beijing and talking about stuff and making agreements that they're never going to follow through on, by the way. Uh, the, you know, the Joint Declaration on Hong Kong is a great example. And take that time and talk to Mongolia and talk to Japan and Korea and talk to Kazakhstan, right? I mean, there's only so much time. And the president only has so much time. This was a big deal uh, during the Trump administration that they're saying, well, the Trump's, the president's not spending enough time in ASEAN like Obama did. Okay, fine. And there is only, there's only so much time in the day and the president can only be in so many places at one time. Well, here's one we can just put on the shelf because these talks are not productive. Uh, when they are productive again, we should start them up again. But it doesn't mean we're not communicating. We can communicate with the ambassador who sits right here. Uh, if you saw Nick Burns, the ambassador to China, if you saw his town hall a month ago, did you guys see that? Didn't I mean, see that one. He was great. He, he finally, I mean, it took him a while, but he finally came around and says, yeah, I don't get anywhere near the same access uh, in here in China that my counterpart uh, gets, Shifang gets in, in DC. Well, let's fix mm-hmm. that. You know, let's get the, let's get the relationship. Let's go Confucian here and, you know, and, and rectify the names, get the uh, relationship back in a normal place. Cause it's not normal. It's way out of whack. Let's get back to reciprocity, start from a common basic foundation and we can build this relationship now that PRC realizes how much they need it. Well, let's say you were the Secretary of State. Uh, what would you do to give the U.S. a, a strategic advantage? How would you uh, uh, change this mess, frankly? I would stop asking for face-to-face talks. Uh, when, when I was uh, there, uh, we, you know, Secretary Pompeo decided that we're not going to do this anymore. This flying all over to get these worthless talks. And we just said, hey, if you guys, we're here. If you want to talk, we're here. Just let us know when you are, and, and we're right here. You can come see us. Look at their, uh, wow, the guy before uh, Wang Yi, uh, 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 Yang Jiechi flew out twice, flew out in August of 19 and flew out in June of 20 to have these conversations with us. And the conversations were like, hey, can you guys tone it down a little bit? They're like, mm, no. So yeah, if we would just stand our ground, stand on principle, uh, work our relationships with like-minded in the region, and that's increasingly everybody, to include Vietnam, um, and let them come to us. We don't have to chase them. Oh, by the way, we still need to talk about that balloon thing, right? There's been no rectification of names on that. I, I would love yeah. to. Yeah. I mean, it didn't happen. It, yeah, it, yeah. No big deal. Uh, I'm curious if, you, you know, we started off talking about Russia and China, and 
I think we've heard from people on the show before that maybe there is a given that there are a lot of competing strategic interests between the two. Maybe there's a way to kind of provo- uh, like pull a reverse Kissinger in a certain sense, right? Like try to like get right. Russia on our side to oh. contain China. What do you think about that idea? It, it, it's poetic when you think about it because now it's a big China when it was a big Soviet Union, a small China, now it's a big China, a small Soviet Union, Russia. Uh, but I think given all that's going on in Ukraine, trying to make a deal with Putin right now would be really hard. Now, if Putin were to like depart somehow and we had new leadership there, that would be a great, you know, they call it triangulation, right? Is bring bring them closer to us than the other side and, and isolate and contain uh, an aggressive and disruptive uh, power in the world. Uh, look, I'm all for engaging with the PRC and giving them a chance to fix the problem, the mistakes they've made, but they have yet demonstrated any sense of introspection or uh, regret. They, this seems to be according to plan. So if this is if this is going to continue, we have to continue. It's not us. They have agency. They've made these decisions. We are simply responding to them. Yeah. So. And that and that's not just a Xi Jinping thing. That is the PRC. CCP. Yeah. yeah. CCP. But that's, that's not to say they can't moderate. They can. They're entirely capable of doing that, right? They just don't want to. It will be very interesting to see what happens in the world when there is no more Putin or Xi Jinping. Yeah. It could be good or it could be bad. You know, power vacuums are dangerous things. Everybody needs to go watch The Death of Stalin one more time. Preview. Yeah. It's a good movie. It was a pretty wide-ranging conversation. That's my fault, but... Uh, well, we like to. It, do it is our pleasure. Yeah, we we like to, we like to do it on the show, and we'll divide this up into clips, so it'll be easy for people to sample all the finest little bits. Uh, it's it's been a real pleasure to have you back on. Uh, oh, we had an idea for another thing to have you on. I, I forget what. Let's talk about next time. Let's talk about the counter the the antidote to uh, PRC political warfare, and that is critical thinking which is what I'm working on really hard here at the Air Force Academy, is to get no kidding curriculum on how to think critically and analytically. Because you know that, that solves social media ills, that solves propaganda and, and PRC, United Front Work Department ills. It solves a lot of things, but we don't do it. It's just too hard. It's just people don't want to do it. So well, There's I mean, lots of th- critical theory that's going around. Yeah, uh, but maybe we'll have you back on in a, in a couple months and we can talk about that. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. Always a pleasure. Take care. Great. Thank you. You know, it's 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 always weird when talking about China because there's there's this sense that like they have this strategic master plan to dominate the world. But then it's also completely incompetent and incapable of doing anything. Well, the problem is that people have to carry out the strategic master plan to dominate the world. But some things are going well, like their influence in the WHO. WTO. I mean, that is like decades of groundwork there. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like they have been tr- infiltrating the WHO since 2004, like post SARS, when the WHO actually made them open up their hospitals and stuff like that. And they realized that, oh, they couldn't have this whole thing where the WHO could make them do something. Mm-hmm. And then they spent 20 years infiltrating the WHO and it really paid off for them. I guess if you're incompetent for long enough, something works or maybe other people are also incompetent so yeah, i think there are there are pocket there are pockets of competence and there are also there's a lot of incompetence the problem is that even if you have pockets of real genuine competence the incompetence elsewhere can really undermine whatever you want to do and also we have to talk about how the communist system similar to the soviet union like how it essentially what dave was talking about how it it prioritizes lying and deception right. so that a lot of the competence is never going to come to fruition. Be- like it's not a meritocracy in the same way. Well, like, I mean, you are incentivized to be incompetent because then it means you're not going to get arrested and put in prison. Yeah, yeah or- that was a big effect of the anti-corruption campaign. There's just a lot of people just stopped doing anything. There was all this apathy because, you know, you don't want to do something that gets you purged. Yeah, I mean, I think the TV show Chernobyl is a good example of, like, the effects of the communist system where, like, you know, all the blame shifting, like, nobody wants to actually be the person to say that there's a problem, you know, like, it's, it 
causes really bad problems to become really, really bad problems because of the way the system is set up. Well, I mean, that's obviously what we saw during the initial part of COVID in like January, 2020, where the CCP, especially local officials, were covering it up, covering it up because they didn't want the, the central authorities to know how bad it was in their region. And the central authorities knew they mm -hmm. were just letting the local officials take the fall, right? right? Like we later found out that Xi Jinping actually knew about the COVID outbreak. Very like, early. Yeah, uh, like in December. Weeks before right. the, like, it, the public admission admittance of it on a nationwide scale. Yeah, yeah. So it's so it's not a case of like oh the it was the local officials trying to cover their own asses. It was it was from the very top. Xi Jinping's got a big ass to cover. Okay. Well, my takeaway from this is that you know, it's kind of sad to know that even a friendship that looks as genuine as Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin is based on lies. They don't actually have a friendship metal made of gold. But if it's just a gold-plated, like, zinc. Zinc is a useful, valuable metal, Matt. Z not Z zinc. zinc is what they use in pennies because copper is too valuable to put inside pennies now. Oh, uh, yes. Don't get Matt started on the penny thing. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's not go there. I'm glad you we have a better... don't want a penny for my thoughts. No, shut up. <laughs> I'm Fair. glad we, have a, we all have a better friendship than Xi Jinping and Putin. Who wants to go for ice cream? I do. Oh, me too. Shut up, Matt. Oh. Thanks for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelly Chan. And I'm Matt Ganesta. We'll see you next time.